Hello and welcome to the Gathering Place of Simi Valley. I'm Dr. Bob Cathers and I'm delighted to have you with us tonight. We're going to be sharing exciting things from God's Word and I promise you that it'll be contrary to the things that you hear on the news. A lot of prophets look at the news and they kind of procrast uh, they prognosticate from the news and they kind of fit it into the Bible. But what we like to do is we like to look at the Bible and say hey let's not look at the news and then declare what's going on let's look at the Word of God and declare what's going on. Because if you look at the news right now you say well there's a major drought in the heartland and we just had a fire up in uh, California that had a major oil refinery and so there's not going to be as much food, There's the price of gas is going to go up. What are we going to do? <laughs> Good question. What are we going to do? We're going to trust in the Word of God. We're going to trust in what God says and not what man says. If a doctor comes to you and says, you have cancer, you have to come back and say, I refuse to accept it. Now, there may be physical facts in your body that there's cancer there. <laughs> but, just like Jesus, when they said, why are we going to see Lazarus again? He said, well, he's sleeping. But the truth was, he was not sleeping. He was dead. However, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So he declares that he is the truth. So if he says he's sleeping, that suddenly becomes the truth, because Jesus is the truth. Jesus was not moved by the circumstance of what was taking place and what was going on. But rather, he created a different circumstance by his faith and by his words. And that's what we want to do. We don't want to just be mimics and parrots of what's going on, but we want to declare what God is saying. And you say, well, what if I'm not a prophet? Well, you have the written word of God and the power of the written word. You have the Holy Spirit with you to give you unction. And you have the ability to change things, if nothing else, within your own life and within your own family. <clears throat> But by changing things in your own life, and your own family, you touch all those around you, and they become affected by it, and a lot of them will say, how can I have those things in my life? And so, we're going to hit the next teaching in a series that we've been doing on finances. And we started out on these Wednesday night meetings with this financial series because of everything that's going on in the country of a financial nature. And we wanted people to be able to realign their finances, not by their circumstances, but by the Word of God. And tonight, uh, really some fun stuff. Um, not only this week, but next week, we're going to have some really fun stuff. Tonight, we're going to, to look how God trained people for prosperity. And the next week, we're going to get into sowing into the field. And a lot of people say, what does that mean? <clears throat> for years, people come to me tithing and go, I'm tithing, but I don't see anything. Well, what do you have in the field? What's that mean? I'm not going to tell you tonight, but we're going to get into that. However, tonight I'd like to start by reading out of the 48th chapter of Isaiah and the 17th verse. And I'll give you a moment to go ahead and turn your Bibles <clears throat> and get there. There? Good. He said, Thus saith the Lord thy Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, I am the Lord thy God, which teach thee to profit. <laughs> Did I read that right? I am the Lord thy God which teaches thee to profit. Not to be a prophet, not to prophesy, but to profit. P-R-O-F-I-T. Uh, prophet, that's increase. Bob, you can't serve God and mammon. I know, we covered that in previous messages, so I don't feel we need to re redo it. But the Lord teaches you to profit. And you know why he teaches you to profit? Because he can't teach you to poverty. God can't teach you to death, to die. He can't teach you to be sick, because he doesn't have sickness. He can't teach you to have poverty, because he doesn't have it. So he has to teach you to do what he does, and that's the prophet. When you think about the nature of God, people have such funny and idiotic doctrines based on all kinds of goofiness. But when you think about God and his nature, what does he do? He teaches you to profit. Now, when they walked in the wilderness for 40 years, he said it humbled them. Humbled them from what? Well, when you remember when God said, here is the land that I've given you. And they said, oh, we can't take the land because there's giants in the land. They hadn't even seen, except for 12 of them. 
They hadn't even seen the land, and they just knew that it was everything that God said. It was full of prosperity. And they said, well, we can't take it. But God had delivered them from captivity, brought them to this land. It was full of milk and honey. It was full of prosperity. They saw that, and they said, we can't take it. So he humbled them. What does humble them? To, to be humble means that when you don't believe what God is saying, you have to go and suffer from not accepting what God is saying. If God said to you, I'm giving you a Porsche. Now, let's say that. Bob, that, that's ridiculous. You know, God wants us to drive Volkswagens. <laughs> now, if God says, I'm giving you a Porsche, you say, no, and you go and you look at the Porsches and you go, oh, I can't afford that. No, he has, a way to, he has a way to give it to you. But if you don't accept the word of the Lord that he's giving you a Porsche, that doesn't mean you go out and put it on your credit card or whatever. It means that it's something he wants to do for you. And so you go out and you buy a Yugo. Well, then you drive a Yugo for the next five years. Why? Because you didn't listen to what God said. Well, that's kind of silly. No, no, that's exactly what happened in Israel. God, God gives them a Cadillac, and they take an old broken down Volkswagen, old Beetle, not the new ones. And so they learn, they learn humility in the wilderness by not receiving what God said. By not receiving what God said, they ended up in poverty. Not listening to God equals poverty. For them, they were wandering in the desert for 40 years. Even though God met their needs, they weren't living in the abundance of the land. In the land of milk and honey, they were wandering around. And so you have to humble yourself to obey what God said. If He said, I'm going to teach you to profit, then you have to humble yourself and say, Okay, God, I may not want anything. I may want to be broke like everybody else. But I'm going to humble myself and I'm going to receive what you have to say to me. And if you want to give me a house or whatever you want to give me. Well, Bob, God wouldn't say I want to give you a, a house. <laughs> what? That's exactly what he would say to you. Not kind of. That's what he was saying to the children of Israel. I have a land prepared for you. You think he's not going to tell you, I have a house prepared for you? Come on. Be realistic. We get so legalistic. So legalistic about what God can and can't say. Oh, you know, I would never ask God for anything. We're just humble worms of the dust. <laughs> well, the humble worms of the dust ate the dust for 40 years because they didn't believe what God said. God wants to teach you how to profit. He wants to teach you to prosper. He wants to teach you many things. But we should be winning souls. Who said you can't win souls? Matter of fact, if you're prosperous, you can buy people lunch and tell them about Jesus. So there. Okay. Thus saith the Lord thy, <clears throat> thus saith the Lord thy Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. I am the Lord thy God, which teaches thee to profit, which leads thee by the way that thou shouldest go. So God teaches us to profit, and He gives us the direction in our lives that we need. This is what He does. Now I want you to look to the book of Genesis and the 18th chapter. And I want you to see one of the reasons that God chose Abraham. If not, maybe, I don't want to say the main reason, but one of the main reasons, let's just say he chose him over Job. In Genesis 18, verse 19, he says, For I know him, who? Abraham. I know him that he will command his children and his household after him and they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he has spoken of him. I know him he will command his children. The NIV says he will direct his children. But when you go through the majority of translations it is the word command and secondarily would be the word direct. So God said, I know that Abraham is going to command. He's going to direct his children. Now when you look at Abraham's children versus, say, Job's children, then you see why God chose Abraham over Job. He would command his children. He would direct them in the ways of the Lord. And <clears throat> when you look at the children of Israel today, around the world, they're prosperous wherever they go. That spirit that was on Abraham to train and teach that God put into him 
it's upon them and wherever they go in the world, they are prosperous. Okay, so we've got that down. I want you to look at Proverbs. Actually, we don't have to actually look there, but Proverbs 22, 6 says, Train up a child in the way that he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. So you can write that down if you're taking notes. Train up a child. And say teach a child. Say train up a child. And what's the difference between training and teaching? Teaching is you go in and you listen to something and go, oh, I learned something. Training is you do it over and over and over and over until it becomes habit. I think it was George Santana that said, habit is more powerful than reason. Habit's a powerful thing. The habits that you develop, most of what you do is based on habits that you develop. And so if you're trained the wrong way, you're trained with the wrong habits. Some people will go into the military because they don't have self-discipline to become disciplined. Some people will go into martial arts to get discipline in their body where they just don't have it. And where we need training, we need spiritual training and we need financial training. Making the wrong financial decisions ultimately can destroy your life. I mean, people will say, we shouldn't spend, you know, we shouldn't spend any time talking about finances. But then, a lot of the decisions you make are based on the finances you have. Where you're going to live, where you send your kids to school, what you're going to drive, what kind of vacation you're going to take this year. It's based on the finances that you have or don't have. And even more importantly is giving. Well, I would like to give to this chair. I'd like to give to that chair. I'd like to help my friend. I'd like to help my parents. I'd like to help my kids. <clears throat> Whoever, a lot of that you can or can't do based on the finances that you do or don't have. And so, so they, they, there is a realm of importance in this arena. And being trained up the wrong way. Most people are trained up, well, I don't say most people. In the modern generations, we've been trained up to live by credit cards. But hopefully this, this amazing debt that we have over our nation right now, over $16 trillion, hopefully that's going to train the next generation not to live by credit, as this last one has. All right. I know how much fun that was for you to hear that. One of my favorite scriptures is Proverbs 13.22. And it says, A good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children and the wealth of the sinners laid up for the just. And we're gonna, we're gonna break this down um, <clears throat> to more than just, you know, we're gonna break down each half of it. A good man, and, and, and here in Proverbs, you know, you can get into semantics, you know, well, there's, the, there's the, the, the good, and then there's the will of God. You can do the good thing, or the, you can do the God thing. Well, that's not what this means here. There's, there's no good or God thing here. When he's saying a good man, he's saying somebody who's in good stead with God. Someone who's in the right place with God. A good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children. So that tells me a lot of things about a good man. Number one, it tells me that a good man is somebody who has planned for the future. He has planned to take care of his, or to, to have seed for his children and his grandchildren to sow. So he's preparing for the generations that are to come. An evil man just cares about himself and spends it up drinking or doing whatever else they want and they have no consideration whatsoever for the future. When you, see, when you see children with no direction, doing whatever, on drugs, a lot of times it's because, not all the time, but a lot of times it's because that's what they were trained to do. They weren't trained to do anything, so they're just kind of not knowing what to do. They're just kind of easing the pain, or they're just going along and anesthetizing themselves. Some will buck the system, and, and they will move on. One of, the, one of the biggest problems with welfare in America is it, it has been trained, there are generations that have been trained to live on welfare. So instead of coming out of a system where they could prosper, where their families could prosper, where they could have abundance and be blessed, they're going from generation to generation, welfare to welfare to welfare. Why? Because the mother or the mom and dad or whoever, that's what they did. And they go to the next generation, do the same thing. Next generation, same thing. So if you were raised up in anything like that at all, and you didn't have a mother or father, especially a father, that trained you up to be prosperous, then you have to be the first generation. You have to go into the Word of God and find some mentors. Be around some men and women who are prosperous and see what, see what they do. 
See what they've done. And, and I don't just mean people that drive good cars and live in good houses. Sometimes it's all on credit. People that really have true prosperity, find out who they are and see the habits that they've done, especially and particularly godly people, because that's what you're looking to do. You cannot just give money to an untrained person and say, okay, I've helped you. You know, there's an old saying is that if you, you give a man a fish, you feed him for a day, but if you teach him to fish, you feed him for life. Well, that is, that, that's really, really a lot of truth in that. If you give people money, you've helped them for a moment, but you haven't helped them long term. So we need to train our children. Part of the inheritance to the next generation is to train them. And, and say, Bob, we're not actually training a lot of finances. We're talking more about what train does. That's true. And next week we will actually get into more of exactly what to do. Um, <clears throat> although I will say this, that in, in training, God wants to train you to hear His voice. If you listen to the voice of the Lord and obey it every day, you will prosper. When you look at the men of the Bible and the women of the Bible that prospered, that's what they did. They listened to the voice of God, they obeyed the voice of God, and ultimately they prospered because of it. And the, even the wisdom that we have came from people hearing God's voice and, and learning His wisdom. But if you give money to an untrained person, and they're just going to blow through that money. You're really, you're really just wasting your money. I remember years ago we had a, a house out in Lancaster and it was... You know, we bring people in from the streets and stuff, and there were people there. We were bringing them groceries and bring different things to help out. And Sunday nights, we'd go up there and I would minister. And um, I remember there was a situation where they got three thousand dollars, and they blew through it. And let's just say this: three thousand dollars today doesn't seem like very much, but back then, that's when house payments were maybe five hundred dollars. It was quite a bit. Um, they blew through it in less than like a week. It was just gone. No trend. They didn't think of. They didn't think of. Oh, we, their thought was, we got three thousand dollars. Ooh, we can go spend money. There was not one thought to. Oh, we got three thousand dollars. We can go invest this. Two different sides. And so the money was gone. If if you're a person like that, it doesn't matter how much is given to you. Ultimately, you will blow it. That's kind of like the Congress of the United States. It doesn't matter how much you give them, ultimately they will blow it. So you have to stop them, the voters have to stop them from taking so much and from spending so much. It's the only way to do it. Um, also, when you think about lottery winners, that's like a lottery winners anonymous. Because so many lottery winners, they win the money and they go out and they spend so much money buying this and buying that and giving this to this person, giving that to that person until some of them are millions of dollars in debt because of lottery money they have coming in and they had to go and it's like you know, it, instead of blessing their lives, it's ruined their lives. A person who doesn't know what to do with money when they get money, instead of investing it, instead of looking at a seed, they lose it. So part of prospering is knowing what to do when wealth comes to you and, and if you're God by the way and God, of course, loves us and He takes care of us, feeds us. But if you're God and you need somebody to handle money for you, are you going to give it to a person that's never handled money, that doesn't know what to do, that blows every cent that comes to him? Or are you going to find somebody that's going to take that money and is going to do the right things with it? Exactly. So start training whatever money you have. Start learning how to cause it to grow. No matter how little, and God will begin to cause an increase. That's, that's maybe one of the greatest truths I can tell you. If you will take the little you have and plant it, cause it to grow, God will give you an increase. I mean, there will be blessings and you will have an increase. I remember many years ago, my wife, you know, we would go back and forth and who did the finances and she says, I don't want the strain of it anymore, you take it. And so I did and I started looking, she was paying minimum on the bills and I said, well, this isn't working. So I started to pay, started, I want to pay more, but then I said, well, I'm going to start saving so much every week. And as I did, suddenly our income increased. So instead of just um, spending more, 
we started saving more and paying more off the bills. And then it increased more. Try that. Paul, I, I don't have a job. Trust God for a job. Ask Him for a job. He'll give you a job. And not just any job, a job that you like. Something you can work at. God is in the business of taking care of you. So, when you, you look at wealthy families, even today, wise, wealthy families, they don't just give money to their children. They make them earn it. They tell them, if you don't work in the business, you're not going to get a cent of inheritance. Uh, Bill Gates even said he, he's given most of his money to charity. Um, his children are going to give him some money. But in other words, what he's telling them is, yeah, you're going to have to earn this on your own. So, so he's being wise. He understands that if he just gives them all this money, that they're never going to accomplish anything in their lives. Had he had billions of dollars, would he have gone out and created Microsoft? Would he have done what he did? I don't know. I don't think so. If everything's handed to you, what's the reason? What's the purpose? What's the drive? We need to, you know, people say, I'm a creative soul and I just want to be artistic. But a lot of times, that doesn't pay the bills. And so, a lot of artistic people go out and do other things and they, they find that there's a merging between the art and the practical and that's when they create companies and that's when they create great businesses. Good, good tip right there. All right, Abraham, he passed his inheritance to Isaac. Now he gave Ishmael some and he gave his other sons and daughters some. But the majority of his, his uh, wealth he passed to Isaac because Isaac, of course, was the heir. But he passed it to Isaac. And then Isaac, um, even before he could pass anything to either Jacob or Esau, when Jacob had to run for his life, he went with nothing. But he had already been trained up by Isaac and by Abraham. And so by the time he came back, he had taken the wealth of the sinner, Laban. He had taken that wealth, and he had two companies of people. He came back as a very wealthy and prosperous man. So he had been trained up in the way that he should go. And he received the inheritance, not just in what was given him, but in the training that was given him. That's key. So... Let's look at a little bit more into the, the second part, the wealth of the sinner. <clears throat> now Jacob, he took the wealth of Laban through hard work. He said a lot of nights he didn't get sleep, he's watching the flocks, what, from wild animals, different things like that. So hard work, wisdom, honesty. Now remember, he was started off as a deceiver, but then he was deceived multiple times by his father-in-law Laban. So, hard work, wisdom, honesty, and of course, dreams from God. In other words, the guidance of the Lord. I believe that prosperity in the lives of believers comes from the guidance of the Lord. Jacob had it, came back with two hosts, two companies of people. Joseph, he took the wealth of Egypt gave some of the best land of Egypt to his family when he saved them in that drought. Joseph took the wealth of Egypt through hard work, honesty, integrity. When he was working for Potiphar, he could have had an affair with Potiphar's wife, but he didn't. He did the integrous thing, wound up in jail, but he still prospered, took the wealth of Egypt because he was a man of honesty, integrity, patience, and of course, he was a man of dreams. Not only did he have dreams, but he had the ability to interpret the dreams of others. And that's part of his wisdom. And thus, he became one of the wealthiest human beings ever. Um, from the dungeon to the throne. If we begin to listen to God every day, just tune in every day and say, Lord, what, what do you want me to do today? I mean, I'm obedient today. Don't just have a routine set up that you do every day. I mean, it's good to have a routine, yes. But have time where you open up in the early part of the day and give that to God and say, what, what do you want me to do today? Sometimes God will wake you up. Sometimes He'll give you a dream. Sometimes He'll set your day in order for you. These are all great things. Don't just write them off, but follow. Follow the dreams. Follow the visions. Follow the leadings, the promptings of the Holy Spirit. And watch the prosperity and the blessing of God come to you. There is a, a member of our church. 
I've known her for many years. And over the years, I gave her, oh, I don't know, probably three or four times words on how God was going to bless her through real estate. And then she went through a messy divorce. <clears throat> um, not her fault at all. And <laughs> it was left in an apartment. But it had all these words in real estate. So she starts to study, uh, she feels led to study to be a paralegal. And every, every step of the way, she, she didn't do anything unless she asked God. And when she felt that God would speak to her, she said, God, please confirm it. And, and because I'd known her so long, she said, please confirm it through Bob. And it was like, it seemed like to me every couple of weeks I had some kind of a word for her. And, and even in the wording, that some of the words were so specific that there was always something specific, something God said to her. There was an exact word in that, even though, even though the word of the Lord was clear to her, but there was exact words as well. And she started, decided to train to become a paralegal, even though she got all these words in real estate. So she goes through these different interviews, can't get hired by anybody. Finally, she gets hired by this guy who's a real estate mogul. And he's going to train her how to do real estate. <laughs> That's kind of like, that's a little bit like going through the jail, isn't it? You know, going from, from having a really nice house to where you live in an apartment to suddenly the Pharaoh, you're at his right hand and he's going to use you and train you. So this is just a, to me it's a great testament. All right, this time, um, <clears throat> we're going to pray in just a moment, but I, I like to do, I like to say this, that any time, you receive a revelation as you have tonight, anytime. You should always sow into the revelation. And whether it's myself or who doesn't matter who is teaching, if you receive something, you should give into it. Um, even if you're even if you're a member of the church and you give your tithes to the church, I'm telling you, if you watch this program and you get something from it, you should actually give into it. Because it seals that revelation. And I, I, I'd ask Kristen, I said, do we get any given at all from the programs? Because I don't follow it real closely. And she said, we have a lot of followers, she goes, but I think at first we had a few. She says, but nobody's giving. And that concerns me because it means that nobody is sealing the revelation. Uh, so no matter what you do, don't, don't watch a broadcast and not give nothing. That's bad grammar, but you get the point. Don't give nothing. Give something. Give something, and even if it's an offering of grace, you know, number five represents grace. Even if it's a grace offering, give something. Give into this ministry, give into this broadcast, because it's only going to help us to do better broadcasts, have better equipment, and put better products out. Having said that, and of course you can you can donate. There's a little donate button underneath there. If you're watching this, it's a later broadcast on YouTube. You can go back to the gathering, see me, and go on to the broadcast at the time and donate there. Um, there will be buttons that show you how to do that. Um, <clears throat> this time I'd like to pray for you. And I'd like to ask the Lord to, to bless you. And I want to ask Him to teach you and to open your ears to listen to Him on a daily basis. Now the Bible says to pray, give us this day our daily bread. So I believe this, that every day you should listen to God about one financial decision. What? Yes. Listen to God about one financial decision. Whether it's to give, whether it's to sow to the fields, whether it's to not buy something, buy something. Whatever it is, there could be a thousand different things. But I want you to listen every day He wants to guide you. So we're going to pray. Heavenly Father, I'm so grateful that through the technology we have today, we can go right into people's living rooms, into their dens, into their offices, into their computers, and speak the living word. Father, I pray that out of Ephesians 1, as Paul prayed, the spirit of wisdom and revelation, and the knowledge of you would come upon them. That everyone would know the calling that you have called them with, and their inheritance. And Father, I pray that, as you said in Isaiah 48, you're the Lord that teaches us to profit. I pray that everyone that hears the sound of my voice, that watches this broadcast, that received this revelation, that took the time to listen, I pray, Father, 
that you would teach them to profit, that it would become part of the daily blessing, part of the daily communion with you, that you would show them how to walk in their daily bread, that you would show them how to walk in daily obedience in every area of their life, of course, but particularly in the financial arena. And Lord, I pray that you teach us how to walk in finances with others, with our friends, with our neighbors, with our family, our husband, our wife, our children. Help us to train our children. Help us to train the next generation. And Lord, show us how to take the wealth of the sinner and put it into the hands of the just. We pray these things tonight and we ask them in your precious name and we receive it tonight. I want to thank you so much for coming and joining tonight at the Gathering Place. I'm Dr. Bob Cathers. I appreciate your time and I bless you and I'll see you next week.